should I turn the music off? I I kept it on on purpose. Oh, <laughs> thanks guys. Comments are very helpful. Uh, yes, this one is removed. Should the music remain or or is it okay? Uh, okay, I'm turning it off. Yeah, that's it. Uh, yes, about the JSON server. Uh, I actually like this one more. It's. Uh, I don't know if the JSON server has authentication on it, but uh, if it does, then it is very similar to this one. This one uses Faker. You can see these nice names here. And uh, so far, you can search for uh, stuff and it returns them. This one is a public endpoint. And then you can go to a login screen and you can log in and register here and then go back to the other screen. And uh, this is not much, but uh, in the last session, I tried to. <laughs> I just okay. I turned off the music, but if you hear some like static noise, just let me know, and then I will turn it back on again. The main idea was to uh, delete all the static noise and I don't know any kind of noise or cancel it. Uh, okay, so uh, I will show you the source code now, and then we can get started. Uh, uh, before that, what we want to do today is that uh, I plan to add uh, uh, a new screen for adding new items and editing items. And this screen will have, it will obviously have a form in it. I think that's the easier part actually. I don't think the form management is that painful. And then it will also be a protected endpoint. I think that one is a bit more tricky to get right. Uh, so we will have to touch the authentication part and the routing part a little bit to, to implement protected endpoints. Okay, and then back to the code. Uh, so this is the, the stack that I am using that is still not open source. Uh, the application is, it has a kind of a three, it has a three layer structure. Uh, it has a view layer, it has a model layer, and it has an API layer. I think it's more than enough to, to build it this way for small applications. So you have the API layer here. It's nothing outstanding here. I use Axios for HTTP, and uh, I have some global interceptors. Uh, later, I plan to handle errors here and fall back to uh, a notification about the error as a last resort. And then I have a couple of endpoints here. I have a global XCS instance with uh, all the like uh, global data, the base URL, the headers, and these kind of things. And probably the only interesting thing here is the authentication. Uh, so I have this nice little object here, this one, it's coming from my stack, it's called storage, and this is actually uh, a proxy of the local storage. So whatever you do with this object gets proxy to the local storage and vice versa. Uh, so you can just, you have an in-memory object that you can play around and then it is reflected in the local storage. So everything you store on this object is uh, kept within sessions. So if you check the login here, I just save the token from the login in the storage object. And if I just go away from the page and then come back to the page, this storage object, object will still have the same token because it is persisted between sessions. It's a tiny little abstraction, but uh, I think it's helpful. Uh, this is, uh, you will see this pattern a few more times with uh, query parameters and Pass name tokens. So this is the API layer, and then I have a store layer here. Uh, it's super simple for now. This is where I store all of the global data for the application. Yes, it's proxy based. It relies pretty heavily on ESX proxies. So right now, it works in all major browsers except for Internet Explorer and. Uh, I got a lot of requests to support Internet Explorer, but still, it's 
I have to recreate this a lot of times, but it's not possible, so it's, it's not going to happen. I can support pretty much everything else, which is more modern. I can even hack around React Native, but not yet. Uh, okay, so this is the model here. Uh, the idea here is that this one is wrapped with an ESX proxy, uh, the whole object. This is what this store does. And uh, this thing here is secretly watching for any kind of mutation. So uh, really you can do anything here. You can use getters, setters, you can use nested data, you can use prototypal inheritance, anything. And then in your components, you will see here, you just use, you just import the, the global store and then you use it as a normal object. And uh, it will automatically pick up the mutations and it will re-render the components when needed. And uh, uh, I, in the last few days, I actually spent some time reviewing, uh, sorry, I was a stalker. I started to review some GitHub random codes that uses this thing, React Easy State, not Easy Stack, uh, to see how people use it. And I still feel like that a lot of, uh, a lot of developers are not uh, getting the hang of it. So I see a lot of things like, you know, this, uh, App store dot product equals app store dot product dot I don't know slice and then map and these kind of things. So a lot of people still use immutable kind of uh, programming with it, but the whole idea is that you don't have to be immutable. You can just use it as as a totally normal object. You can use immutable data, but you can you can do anything that you would normally do with JavaScript. The idea is that. Ah, it's like Mobex, except it's, so this is the whole API. It has a store and a view. Uh, but Mobex is also going this way. <laughs> okay, so uh, before I start coding, just one more thing that I wanted to show you. Uh, in the last stream, if you watched me, I I tried to do some, yes, the, the, the last stream was two weeks ago and uh, there was a lot of hype about the neighbor mobs suspense demo. I guess most of you saw that. Uh, so I tried to, to ride the hype train and I tried to do something similar to the suspense. Uh, but actually I failed a, bit, a little bit and it was not because of the code, it's because of the deployment. I still can't really deploy that code somewhere. Uh, so I want to show it now. So the idea is that uh, if I go to the network, so if I search for something, it searches and it shows it to me. And if I go to a super slow connection and I search for something, it searches for it. It still searches, but I have previously already searched for fresh. So if you check it with Rustic again, I already searched for Rustic, so it falls back to the offline cached version, and now it updates to the real Rustic that it got from the server. And what I uh, try to show off, apart from this, is the offline usage. So right now, if you check it, we are completely offline. And if I search for Fresh, or if I search for Rustic, the application works as it should. But if I search for uh, I already searched for both, but uh, you can see here that uh, all of these are failing. It falls back to the offline data cache, caching, so I'm pretty sure I never searched for sleek. And you see that there is no sleek here. There should be a sleek here. If I go online now and I search for sleek, and we are in slow 3G, yeah, okay. Uh, you saw that it, it found Sleek super slowly. We are still on a slow connection. If I go to Rustic again, it finds Rustic. And if I search for Sleek again, last time, you see that it's a lot faster now. It falls back to the offline cache version. And now it gets the data from the API. Uh, so this is what I wanted to show off last time. This is what I worked on. It's a uh, kind of similar to Suspense. The idea is to have an application that is enjoyable for everybody. It can work for fast internet, it works for slow internet, it works for offline usage, and then really try to cover everything, all of the use cases. 
because uh, uh, Internet Explorer is kind of a choice of the end user, but uh, Internet speed is not always a choice. So I think it's it's pretty important to cover to cover all of the scenarios. Okay, so just one more thing before we get started. The way it is implemented is this little thing here. If you used Angular before, you are probably familiar with this resolve thing. Uh, this is the router from my own React stack. It's uh, super simple. You have a router and you have chives inside and every child has a page. Uh, and if the, the, the path name token here matches with the page, uh, then this page is displayed. And then you have this resolve. This is probably familiar from Angular. Uh, and uh, so the idea here is that uh, you should not uh, you should not root synchronously and then display uh, a loader. Uh, you should display a loader and leave the old view there as long as the new view is not available. So you always have something to play around with. This is the same thing that uh, the suspense guys, uh, like Dan Abram showed. Uh, to always give something to the user, user. It is a pretty bad experience when you only have a loader here and then you have nothing to play around with. So this is what this resolve does. And then you have this timeout here. Uh, it tells that uh, Okay, we have a super slow connection. Uh, Resolve didn't fetch the data in 800 milliseconds, so let's just route to the to the new page that we should route to and uh, display some fallback data here. And as a last resort, if I don't have offline data, if I don't have the data from the API, if I don't have anything, then it's okay to display placeholders and loaders and these kind of things. But uh, I think that's the the final thing to do when you really can't do anything else. Okay, so let's start coding. Ah, sorry about this. It was my phone. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we are going to add a button here in the product list component. This is uh, the component that you see here and uh, we are using material ui so i'm going to need uh, uh, button from material ui slash button oh for the styling as you can see uh, this is the simplest thing that i could come up with i use material ui and i use the bare bone inline styles uh, so I don't use any context and uh, themes and these kind of things. Uh, this is only, I think it's okay for small apps, but for bigger apps you should set up the whole theming thing. And I am going to need the add icon from material UI icons. Add, add hopefully, we will see. And then here, yeah, another thing. I think the icon doesn't like the button doesn't belong in the in the list of components, so I will use a fragment here. If you're not familiar with this, this is new in React 16. It's just a, it's kind of a virtual element. It doesn't render anything into the DOM. Uh, so it's useful to wrap things in single components so that you can return them from the render when you don't want to do div soups in the actual end result. And then we are going to need a button. And oh, I have prettier enabled. Uh, and the color should be primary. And I have to check this because I'm not sure about uh, the variant here. Uh, okay, so this is what I am going to need. And for this, uh, I know that I, I have to provide 
fun property to this, uh, to actually have this nice round look. Uh, so it should be variant. And I am going to need variant fabs, if I remember correctly. Fab. I have no idea what that means. Fabulous, maybe. And inside the button, I will need an add icon. Okay. And I will also need super simple add button, button style here. This is the less exciting part. Uh, position should be fixed and right should be 20, button should be 20, hopefully. So the style should be at button style. Okay, uh, so we have this button here. If we check it. Uh, Yep, there we have this little button. Okay, one more thing. Uh, so let's get back to the main application. Here we have a router and we are going to need one more screen for the products. Uh, so let's call this product editor and the page should be product for it. And for now that's enough. So we are going to need this uh, standard JS. Uh, I prefer standard JS actually. I always use standard JS. It's just uh, I use Prettier for this project uh, to auto format my code. Uh, but I only do this for live streaming. I prefer to to format code in pre pre commit hooks and these kind of things. So and I was just lazy to. This is the default configuration of Prettier, so I was lazy to to configure it to use standard JS. Uh, product, but I don't think it matters actually. If you if you use a, if you stick to the same standard for the code base, then it doesn't really matter. So let's make a product editor component. Ah, sorry for my product editor. Okay, and for the product editor, I am just going to copy this one because this is already a product. It should be similar. Okay. How long? I have no idea, honestly. It's two years, around two years, I think. I don't even know how old is React. It's, uh, I started working with React a bit before MobX came out, or I don't know, got popular when it when, way before it was called Mob Observable. Uh, so this, that was my first uh, state management library. MobX was it's still pretty cool, but it was very good back then, I think. Uh, and it is getting better, so it's a cool man. Uh, I don't know if you know about that, but it's also migrating to ES6 proxies for the next version. You probably know it if you follow React, React Nand. Okay, so we have a product editor here. Uh, and uh, let's just, uh, for now, it's enough to return a div saying that this one is a product editor. Okay, so we have the routing in place for the product editor. And the last thing we need is a link to the product editor. So in the product list, we are going to need a link. And uh, we are going to put this whole button inside the link. This is just one way to do it, but... Okay, and the link should point to the product page. Uh, let's change this 
style like this one editor sorry rename okay let's see what we got product editor is not found it still has to Uh, no, you can't. You can't support ESX proxies. If uh, you can't support Internet Explorer if you have ESX proxies, so I know that Emer supports them, but uh, you can only support a very limited subset. And that's the. If you think about it, that's the cool part of ESX proxies. That's why everyone is so hyped about them recently. It's because they add. They are one of the very few additions to the language that is actually not polyfillable. Everything that can be polyfilled is not that exciting because you could have done the, the libraries which uses that feature ages ago. With proxies, you can actually do some new cool stuff that couldn't be done before. Uh, and if you are doing something that can be polyfilled and uses proxies, then uh, it's nothing very new. You can do the same thing with getters and setters. Uh, but view does and mobex does and a lot of other libraries does so that's the fallback that you can do for a subset of proxying so we have this button here and if you check it uh, it throws a very nice error we are checking it in a second oh yeah sure uh, because we don't have a product here okay just wanted to uh, sorry my it's a bit too much for my computer to do streaming and uh, running. I even have a server open. I will just close it now. Yeah, we have the product editor now. So we just added a new page. Uh, so if we go back to products, we see a product here. And then if we click this button, we go to the product page. And then you can see that this one is a product editor. Okay, uh, so uh, actually we will need one more link to the product editor. I prefer to do a single component for editing and saving and adding new products because they are very similar to each other. Uh, I hope it will work out well, I don't know yet, but uh, hopefully. So we will need a link here too. And we should uh, wrap the card content in the link and it should again point to the product page. And now we also have an ID actually. So we will pass the ID too to the products page so that we can fetch it there. Uh, okay, and it's reloading. So if we go back to the Rustic page and we click here, we go to the product page and then you can see that we already have an ID uh, uh, for because we are editing this very specific product. If we go back to this page and click on it, you can see we don't have an ID. It's a pretty standard routing. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is uh, getting the product and uh, course between uh, components that are to a, that are in a parent to child relation to each other you just pass down the data with uh, uh, with props but here these are pages so it's pretty important to not do this uh, because if I ah, you will see later uh, so because if I I load the page with uh, like this URL it should fetch the product. There is no product now that uh, there is no parent component that could pass the product. There is some logic needed. So the best place to do this is again a resolve. So we should uh, resolve product. Uh, we should add the resolve here again. But this does is it calls the app store resolve product function before it routes to the product editor page and uh, it waits for it if it's an async function or if it returns a promise so we are going to add an async resolve resolve pro tact here and 
we are going to uh -huh. I will explain this in a second await uh, API dot resolve uh, let's call it fetch fetch product farms dot ID okay so there is a lot of thing going on here uh, so if I click any link or the back button or anything else that uh, triggers the routing, then the router will try to route to this page. But before it can route, it will call this function here, the resolve function. And it will wait for the result of the resolve function. And you can do three things in resolve functions. Uh, you can mutate global stores here, or you can do anything, but there are three uh, very distinct things that make sense in resolve functions. So first thing is that uh, you can mutate uh, uh, the global store here. Await errors in a nice way. Uh, I will get to that. I plan to do that in the last stream or maybe the next stream. Uh, I, if, if you know that you can fall back in a, so I am answering the, how would you handle await errors in a nice way? Uh, if you if you know that you can handle it in a nice way and you actually have a fallback, then I would just uh, handle them right away. I don't think it matters if you if you use try catch or if you use promises. They are equally well. Uh, so it is, but uh, most of the time you actually can't do anything about errors. They are network errors and these kind of things. And if you don't have offline fallback, then I think it's just uh, it's the best to let it bubble up all the way, and then at the very end just uh, have a generic uh, notification handler that uh, that just shows that oh something went wrong or something like that. You know the dinosaur for Google, something like that. I think a lot of developers overdo. Uh, error handling and they just do the same thing in a very so they always put everything in try catch blocks and then they just display the same message for everything instead of having it in central place uh, so here uh, I don't know what you mean by it would not fit in the code well uh, I, I will do a stream about error handling uh, maybe even this stream if you have the time at the end, but I doubt that. Uh, so, for network errors, I would just do a general interceptor that I have here and display notifications from here. I would just do something like uh, app, I don't know, mutate that or notify, you know, something like this. Uh, for other kind of errors, I'm not sure yet. We will see. The way to GS. Uh, let me check it. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, so you have just a second. Oh, this is. I see. I think this is influenced by some other languages. Uh, you can do that, but uh, as I said, it's it's too fine great for my taste. I I don't like to handle errors in this level of granularity. Uh, yeah, okay, let's go. Uh, so we have this resolve product function here, and as I said, uh, you can do. Uh, three things in resolve. Uh, one thing that makes sense is to mutate like uh, uh, something like this. Uh, await API dot get data. So you can mutate the global stores here and they will just update the needed components. The other thing is that uh, you can return some data. This is going to be passed as props to the component that is going to be rendered at the end of the routing. And the last thing that you could do uh, is you could return heavy comp and data. So you could you could do lazy loading and code splitting. So you could do something like. Uh, 
heavy comp sequence await import like that, something like this. So, and then this is going to be the component that is rendered eventually at the end of the routing. So these are the three things that uh, is advised to do in resolves. And the nice part is that uh, if you do it in a resolve, then the user still has the old page to pay, pay around while this one is, is happening. You don't get to have a blank screen with nothing on it while stuff is loading. So right now I'm actually passing some uh, props to the product page. So if everything goes well, we have uh, const pro uh, name description this.props.product. We should have a product here. And instead of the product editor, I will just JSON for a stringify. Oh. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. No. Let's just write out the name. Okay. And the last thing that I left out is that uh, this params object here. Yeah, I don't have errors. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, oh, about the resolving. It's outside of the render. It doesn't trigger uh, error boundaries for now, but it has some kind of... I don't want to get deep into this because I will write documentation about it, but it has it has an error handling mechanism and fallbacks and these kind of things. Uh, I don't know if you saw when I uh, showed the offline usage. It actually it threw, it threw a, a lot of errors because uh, the networking wasn't there and it just falls back to the content when needed. So I will get back to this in another stream. Uh, okay, so about this params object, uh, it's uh, an object representation of the current query parameters. It's uh, again, it has a two-way binding. So if you change the query parameters with routing or anything like that, this one is updated. And you can even do things, I will show this later, but if I would do like params. Uh, name equals name, then this one would be reflected in the query parameters. Uh, yes, six proxies are awesome. This is done by them. So here we just uh, check if we have an ID parameter and if we do not have an ID, then we should return a dummy product, which is uh, just a shell for the new product that is going to come. So this one should work, we will see. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, product, resolve product, fetch product. Let's see if we even call. Uh, uh, it is possible that uh, the library is not yet uh, working. I will check it, but hopefully it works. Uh, because it is still in development, so I just changed a few things very recently about it to add support for React Native. So we are checking it in a second. Mm -hmm. and then let's get the product editor. And instead of this, uh, let's just console log this dot props. Let's see what's up. Not here. Okay. That's because... Oh, I see. Uh, I was speaking about a lot of other things and uh, I forget to add... Uh, I don't know why I didn't get a normal error message for it. Uh, so async function fetch product and it needs a product ID and it should uh, yeah thanks <laughs> and it should await API dot get if I remember correctly it should be slash products slash uh, the ID and we should just return the data here. 
So we have a fresh product here. And uh, App Store is going to call the fresh, fresh product. Okay, page product, product is undefined. Why is it undefined? Okay, and then if we go back to Rustic, that's the favorite one. And we click on it, then we actually have a product here. Awesome. Let's, let's leave it like this. Okay, cool. So everything is in place now. Uh, and again, we have the basic functionality now. You will see, I am just going to copy the login screen because it has a lot of, uh, it already has a form group in it. So you're going to need a few material UI components. And we are also going to need a few forms, like at least two text fields. Uh, product editor. So, oh yeah, let's close form group. Okay, and now we are going to make a form for the product. And uh, so for this, I will need a local store. Uh, the state management uh, of the easy stack it has do you, these two functions it has the store and it has the view and the idea is that uh, whenever you mutate something that is somehow inside an object that is grabbed by store it can be nested it can be anything uh, then any view that uses that piece of data uh, is re-rendered uh, to update to the to the new state so and it doesn't matter where you put these stores. So you can have like uh, global stores like the app store and then uh, you can import this store anywhere and then you can use it in a lot of components and then you have global connected state or you can have local stores like this one and then you can have local state. This is very similar to state and set state except that uh, you don't have to do set state. It's a uh, normal mutable object. So you can do anything with the store without immutable magic. Uh, okay, and we are going to add a few things to the store later. Uh, let's add the changes object. And then we also have product and the props. And we are going to need the name and the description from object assign uh, I'm going to explain this in a second. This is the uh, store. Okay. So we are constructing a brand new object. This is just one way to do this. We are constructing a brand new object from the product and the changes. And we are getting the name and description and these kind of things uh, from that. And these are the values that we are going to use in the control components. So basically they will reflect the latest changes, but uh, they will use the product as a base value. And they don't mutate the product directly because because I don't want to. Uh, because I don't want to mutate the product until I actually hit the save button. So if I wouldn't do this and I would do like value equals pro product dot I don't know email, uh, don't do this. Because uh, this would mutate the product all around in your local computer. And then you would hit save uh, and the network request would fail if you don't have proper error handling and notifications the user wouldn't notice it 
everything would update in real time on his or her computer and nobody would notice that it was not propagated to the server. So always reflect the latest changes, but also keep the last saved state somewhere to, to fall back to it if, if something went wrong. Would that make sense? Would you deep clone it if it had depth? Uh, if it had depth and it would Probably I would make a library to handle that. Uh, I don't know if I would deep clone that. I would do something different and I would I would generalize it and save it somewhere. Uh, didn't happen to me so far. Uh, and I'm playing around with things. So this is not how I usually handle forms. I always do it differently. For this simple case, I think this, this one, this one is okay. Uh, sometimes you even have to keep history and then it gets more complicated. But for, for this one, Okay, and again another little trick that I usually do, and I think a lot of people do, is uh, with the on change event, I actually add these little name attributes to my text field, so I don't have to do tons of different on changes for all of the fields. I just do this dot store dot changes even dot target dot name equals event target value. Uh, so you can use the same event handler for, for everything that has a name. And what we have here, we have a simple text field that's, that has a name of name and the label name. And this one has to be controlled. I will get back to this. Uh, and the value should be name again this name is coming from changes and fallbacks to product falls back to product and again we have to do the same for the uh, there is a description here for now and label should be description and again the value should be description still a lot of boilerplate and it should be a multi-line i hope it's, it's like this Mm. Yeah, I am cheating a bit. This one is a simple form. It will get a bit more exciting with time, but uh, nothing mind blowing. Uh, okay. So. We have this, yes. Uh, the reason why this has to be controlled components is that uh, if you check uh, the login screen and you don't know the, the difference, uh, these are not controlled components uh, because they are the only source of the data that they are represent. Uh, so they are always in sync with uh, themselves, obviously, because the data cannot come from anywhere else except them. And here at the product editor, this has to be controlled components because uh, the data that they represent it either comes from them or it comes from the probes that comes from networking and it can be triggered with back buttons and page loads and these kind of things. So if there are multiple sources of the same data that the field represents, then you have to turn them in controlled components to, to always stay in sync. Uh, let's see what we have now. Ta-da! Uh, so uh, if we load the page, with an ID, it loads the component, it displays the data that it has, you can edit this, but uh, you cannot save it yet, obviously, because we didn't implement it. And again, if you go back to, I don't know, plastic, and you click on the plus button, you see that you have an empty component here, there is no ID here. Uh, if you go back again, and you click on an actual component, it loads the data, it has an ID, you can edit this. Uh, it's important to co cover all the cases. So if you have something like this, uh, you so if you make a new page, uh, it's not only the the buttons that are important in the browser. So it's not enough to click on all of the buttons that gets you to the page. You always have to check how it behaves on page reload with the parameters, and also how it behaves with uh, like the back and the forward button. These are something that uh, people usually oversight and. 
things just totally break when you try to use it as an actual web page. Uh, okay, so now we have this small form and we are going to need two buttons probably. Uh, one should be uh, just one button, I guess. Should be uh, yes. Let's not call it save. Uh, I am tinkering. Uh, so we have the same. Uh, the same component for editing and saving. So what I'm going to do here is that uh, uh, if there is an ID, it means that uh, we are uh, edit. Uh, what are these actually? Uh, these are receipts. Hopefully, the products. These are products. Uh, so, if there is an ID, we are editing. Otherwise, we are uh, adding stuff. And again, we should display the label here. And we need an um, change. Again, this uh, this approach to have a single component for creating new data and editing old data. Uh, uh, yes, we are going to upload it on YouTube, I think. Uh, so this approach uh, of having a single component for editing and creating data, it works nicely for this very small application, but for bigger ones, uh, you should think twice before doing this. Uh, because there will be subtle differences, it's more and more of them, and you will have a lot of uh, ternaries and ifs in the render. So we have an on save here, and again we are going to use the same little trick. If params dot, if we have an ID, then call app store dot save product, and we are going to uh sorry, edit product, and we are going to need the ID for that and uh, probably we are going to this dot star dot changes. I don't know if we are going to need uh, I will have to check the API. I don't know if the edit endpoint needs the whole new data or only the changes. If it only needs the changes then this one is okay. And if we do not have uh, an ID, it means that uh, this one is going to be a new product. Then uh, we will need to. Uh, I am going to get back to this. And probably this one will. Yeah, let's do this later. Okay. Mm-hmm. Should be this that I'll save. <laughs> F store is not defined. Yeah, I make a lot of mistakes and it's very demanding on my computer because it has to live reload. Uh, F store from slash F store. Okay. So as you can see, this one is uh, editing the product, and then if I go back to the other screen, Rustic is my magic word. I do know that there is one item with Rustic. Ah, oh, sorry, it's still editing. And if I go back here, and then I can add the product. Uh, okay, and if I do something like this, here we are. 
component is changing an uncontrolled input of type text to be controlled. Yes, that's a very thing. So uh, this is one thing that uh, I don't know if anyone can explain this. Uh, I, I still don't know why React is da does this. Uh, but it is complaining if you are uh, turning an uncontrolled component into a controlled component and you really shouldn't do that. But in this case, I want this to be a controlled component from the very beginning and still it throws an, everything works correctly, but it throws an ugly error because these ones are undefined in the very beginning. And of course, from React's perspective, uh, it can't know if I am making a mistake and switching between controlled and uncontrolled components. But from my perspective, I do know that I want controlled components and I do know that the initial value is undefined. And this is just annoying uh, to me. I just keep getting back to this problem all the time and uh, it's annoying. So if you know any elegant workarounds or if you know why React devs decided to do this, then enlighten me. It would be nice. Uh, so for now, Let's just uh, work around this with, uh, actually this is not bad because, yeah, it's bad, Never mind. Changes. I'm thinking about a nice solution here. Uh, what I could do probably is to have a little product shell here. And this is a nice documentation for it. So I can have a name. I could even add placeholders here later if I want to. I can have a description. And later here, again, let's check if we have parents.id. If we have it, then changes should be an empty object. Otherwise, it should be product. It should be a shell. Uh, and I think this one will work. Yeah. Yeah, at first I was also thinking about that uh, or thing, but uh, I didn't really. Mm, I don't know, everything feels dirty in this case. Shouldn't shall be a factory. Uh, if you know what you're doing, then it shouldn't be a factory. Uh, because right now, if you check it, I am very careful not to, to mutate uh, the template data, the product and the changes. Uh, so if you are doing things like this, then there is no reason to, uh, to just uh, produce garbage uh, by making new objects all the time. But if you, uh, if there is someone else on the project who doesn't check the source code or you don't have comments about this, then it's very likely that people will start to do things like this, which is very, it's a very common error in any kind of JavaScript or programming, not just here. So you just this do something like uh, uh, changes and something other, and then the very, very end they use the object for uh, for an end result and uh, people don't even notice this but uh, because they are, they only care about this at the very end but uh, they actually mutate the, the template data and every single run of this thing will be different and yes I think this is what very mutation such sadness yeah so if you want to make it robust for other people then you should make a factory in this case I know that I won't eat it, so I just leave it like that. Well, that's a good point. Uh, okay, so let's get back to the App Store. Uh, I, I don't even have to add this to the App Store. For now, they will just proxy to the API, if I, if I think correctly. But let's just do some boilerplate, because why not? Let's add the save, save product. And this should await api.save product 
product and let's add an async edit product id data uh, again as i said i don't know if, if this should be a data but the change is only or it should be the whole product we will see later and this should await api so it's just a simple proxy in here edit product id data uh, i could call the api directly fetch product and we are going to export export async function I don't know what's up uh, save product oh. and it needs a product probably it is I don't know what it returns but hopefully the saved product I will get back to this later uh, and it should be api.post I am pretty sure that Robby got it right so yeah, if you are a backend developer I think this is super important for the frontend guys uh, there are two things here first is to have uh, a standardized naming I think this is the most common practice to have everything pluralized so this shouldn't be product so that uh, I can just write code without checking the documentation all the time and the other thing is uh, for the save endpoints, you should return the, the saved data so that I can get an ID because uh, frontend people use the ID for querying, editing, keying, a lot of different things. And uh, if you do not return the, the saved product in the DB, I do not have the ID here. Uh, so what I see a lot of times is that people do a save product and it doesn't return ID, but I do need an ID. And the only way I can get that ID is by calling the fetch list of products, uh, which fetches a lot of products and then somehow I get the ID out of that thing. I find the item and I get the ID out of that thing. And that's annoying when you have to do that. <laughs> yes, or you can just screw with the backend developers and start the war and put IDs in the front end. That's <laughs> yeah. If you are super angry, you can do that. Uh, so we have the data here. I forget to add the product. And again, we are going to need um, edit product. We are running out of time slowly. I plan to do a, a shorter one this time. Uh, so we are going to do this and then probably finish it. Uh, yes, and we also need an ID here. So we have an ID. And if everything is correct. Save product, edit product, super nice, we have the product editor. Okay, let's see what we have. So we are going to get an error, obviously. It's going to be a title and disk. And let's get to the networking and if everything goes right. Uh, yeah, great, we got an error because we are unauthorized. So we have to uh, connect this with the authentication and uh, if we can do this quickly then uh, I think that will be the last part of it for now so we already have some authentication I don't know if it's working already or not let me check uh, gmail password uh, let's check if it works so I want to register and if you check it, it registered and uh, if you check the application, if you check the application here and the local storage and the local storage for this one, you can see that uh, the token is already saved here because as I said, uh, we have this little 
storage in React Easy Stack. And uh, this one is reflected in the local storage to be reflected. Actually, there are three, three objects like that. You have storage, you have params, and you have path. Uh, the last one, it shouldn't be used a lot of times, but uh, you can use it. And uh, if you, uh, let me show it with the params. Uh, so, uh, let's just get back to the product editor and in the on change, just uh, as a little play, I will params and we are also reflect things in the parameters so if we go to uh, I decided to do this because uh, everything is because past experiences uh, I saw a lot of people struggling with uh, updating query parameters uh, without state changes. So if you have forms, you usually have a lot of, uh, I like to call that data shell. You have a lot of primitives from the user that defines the current state of the application and you would like to have that in the query parameters usually so that the application is shareable by URL. And uh, uh, there is no actual routing going on there. You are just uh, uh, changing some parameters. And I saw a lot of things like uh, root to this page with the new parameters with history false this is some angular stuff that uh, i saw a lot of times and uh, to go against this thing you can just see that uh, uh, you have this little params object and if you mutate it it is automatically reflected so if you are if you are in a state and you don't want to root anywhere you don't have to root anywhere you just add that uh, you have a name and then you add that the description is of course this is not the best example but uh, uh, but uh, that's why i have it here and as you can see it lags a little bit behind uh, that's because uh, it uses a uh, recursive callback or how it is called uh, so it only does stuff when there is nothing else to do because it's pretty small priority to update the URL in this case. And you have the same thing with local storage and with, uh, with the URL pass. So let's just change this back to how it was. I don't want to save this in the parameters. Uh, it's was this dot store dot, oh, let's just delete this. Okay, and I guess we are already logged in. So if we go to the good old Rustic and try to add a few exclamation marks and edit the product, we are unauthorized. That sucks. Uh, why are we unauthorized? because we do not send the API token token is here okay that's a good question uh, I have no idea where is the issue uh, as you can see I actually send down the token that I got back from registration and it still says that I am unauthorized so Let's do a little bit of debugging, and if it doesn't work out, I will just have a little brainstorming with Robbie, the creator of the, the API server, and solve this for the next session. Uh, so I will just try to, because uh, having proper authorization is uh, authentication is, is kind of needed for the protected endpoints that I want to do. Let's just clear the side data for now. Let's get back to the login page. And it was uh, my name backward and PSV. And uh, don't even need a username for the login, but uh, let's just add it. 
Uh, okay, and let's log in. Yes, we have a response, we have a token. Successfully logged in. It has this by C ending. And then if we go and search for some fresh stuff this time, then you can see that we have the token here. It has the same ending. So if we would want to edit this thing, it should work. Uh, at least it shouldn't throw an unauthorized. Oh, yeah. And it throws an unauthorized error. Even though it has the token. Uh, let's check the documentation. I might do something wrong. It's probably on my side. So I'm registering and let's see the edit products. Perfect. So it needs a content type and the token. I'm going to add the content type. I don't think that's that's the issue, but uh, let's do this. So I have this nice global instance here, so I don't have to add it to every single uh, API request. Application slash JSON. <laughs> I like Postman too. But uh, uh, for this one it works. I think APR is, is okay. I just started to use Postman a few weeks ago and it was very enjoyable. Mm, so it shouldn't be the issue. So if you didn't get it uh, or I was too quick, the issue here is that I am sending the token uh, that I got back from registration and still it tells me that I'm unauthorized. So probably I am. Either there is some issue with the backend, or the more likely one is that I am putting it in a bad place, in the bad header. I don't know, I don't name it correctly. I should prefix it with beer or anything like that. We will check it in a second. Uh, headers, body, response. Oh, I have to be an administrator. I didn't even know that this one is a feature in this thing. So I was a logged in feature, but I was not an administrator. If I uh, let's check this one. Yep, I was not an administrator. So I have to check how to become an administrator. I didn't even know that I, I can be an admin with this thing. We can add a new product. So let's check login. Let's check register. Huh. I'm a bit lost now. Here is an administrator, you can add a new product to the list. As an administrator, as an administrator. Oh, okay, so I am pretty sure that I am missing something, but I actually don't know how to become an administrator in the in the server that I am using. And I have to be an administrator to, to do the stuff that I want to do. So I think I will have a little uh, little talk with the author of the server, Robbie, and then I will continue with the next session. I will continue with protected routes and uh, uh, error handling and notifications and these kind of things in the next session. And I think there will be two or three more sessions until the app is completed. I want to, at the end, I want to make it... Uh, Sorry to interrupt, yeah. yeah. Uh, there is a preceded uh, admin app. I just dropped it into the chat. Ah, super cool. Uh, so Robbie is the the god of admins. It was seated in the DB. 
I got some help. Uh, last video, uh, I think it will be in the next video because I don't want to start it now, I'm getting tired. So see you next week. Yep, yeah, there will be a... So I had to skip last week because I wasn't available, but for the next two weeks I think I will, I will do streams. So see you next time.